everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Trust Talk, More Than Meets the Eye, Complicating the Histories of Colonial Portraits. We are thrilled today to present a lecture from Janine Bolt, um, and she will be followed in conversation with curator Daniel Ackerman. Um, Janine Bolt is the 2018-2020 Andrew Mellon Foundation postdoctoral curatorial fellow at the American Philosophical Society where she has curated and curated a few different exhibitions. Most recently, she is the curator of the Dr. Franklin Citizen and Scientist exhibition. She received her PhD in American Studies from William and Mary in 2018 and launched the interactive database Colonial Virginia Portraits. Um, she's an amazing scholar and we are so thrilled to share her work. Daniel Ackerman is the interim chief curator at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, and he received his PhD from UNC Chapel Hill, and we can't wait to see him in conversation. Um, if you enjoy programs like this and um, you want to support decorative arts scholarship as well as emerging scholars, please consider donating to the Decorative Arts Trust. Uh, we depend on your support and participation. And um, this lecture tonight would not be made, would not have been possible without support from the Marie and John Zimmerman Fund. So thank you so much for that sponsorship. And without further ado, I turn it over to Janine. Janine? For tonight's talk, I thought I would focus on two portraits in particular. I picked these because one represents early colonial portraiture dating to 1716, and the other represents late colonial portraiture from 1772. Their subjects, Lucy Park Bird and George Washington, are well documented, so we know quite a bit about their lives when they were painted. The histories and interpretations I'm going to share with you tonight are not the only ones. Right? There are other stories one could tell about these images, but I'm just going to briefly focus on some overlooked aspects of these paintings' complicated histories to hint at the many avenues of discussion and research that portraits can offer. These portraits also provide excellent examples of how we can consider the ways that diverse peoples have influenced early American art and how we can think more inclusively about how we interpret early American portraits today. Lucy Park, Lucy Park Bird was born in Virginia in 1688 and married William Bird II of Westover Plantation in 1706. William Bird was a tobacco planter a trader involved with the Southeastern Indian trade and the African slave trade, and he was a colonial official. William also kept a daily diary, and one of the diaries that survives records the years 1709 to 1712. So this diary is the most detailed record of Lucy's life, although obviously the diary is all from William's perspective and is extremely biased. Lucy herself left very little behind, but luckily she did leave us with this incredibly rich portrait. Lucy's portrait was painted in 1716 on a trip to England. Her husband was already there on business when she arrived early that year, and she died in October 1716 of smallpox, meaning that her portrait was painted within a relatively short window of time in 1716. As of this moment, I do not know who the artist was that painted Lucy, though she was painted in the fashionable style set by London's premier artist, Sir Godfrey Kneller. And she was probably painted in a studio in London, and she was very likely involved in the commission. It was not unusual for women, especially in England, to be involved in their portrait commission. And her husband's diary records a woman with a very strong personality who likely would have been involved in her portrait and had a say in what it looked like. Lucy appears in her portrait very assertively. She stands right up against the picture plane, directly facing the viewer. Her body is not angled away or set back in the composition, as was far more common in women's portraits. She points with one hand to her right where a basket sits. This basket was almost certainly made by a Southeastern indigenous woman. A piece of white English fabric hangs out of it, probably a linen handkerchief. And to Lucy's left, an enslaved attendant stands and offers her an elaborately embroidered textile. The whole scene takes place in the forest. So let's break this image down a little bit. This image of Lucy as a self-assured, assertive woman accords with the diary of her husband. Though William often wrote about Lucy's behavior in negative terms, her strong personality comes through in the diary nonetheless. 
And at one point, William jokingly called Lucy the governor. We can compare Lucy's image to the portrait of William's second wife, Mariah Taylor, to see how her personality was captured on canvas. In contrast to Lucy, Mariah was barely mentioned in William's later diary. Mariah was raised in Kensington, England, and was more passive in their marriage. In her portrait, painted in England before Mariah relocated to Virginia, she sits at an angle with her legs partly spread. She holds a small cup which collects water. Overall, she's painted as a more passive, even receptive vessel, as opposed to Lucy, who controls her image. Her portrait, as well as details about Lucy's life, challenged many ideas about women being passive or under the control of their husbands in the 18th century. Her father, Daniel Park, had left Virginia permanently when Lucy was only nine, leaving his wife, Jane Ludwell Park, to manage the family and in the plantation. But what's important to think about in terms of Lucy and her portrait is that she was the product of a female-run household and essentially grew up without a father in her life. And her portrait paints her as dominating a Virginia household, first with her, her posture, but also with the other elements of the composition, including an enslaved domestic attendant, a basket, and textiles, all associated with households and household management. A non-white attendant appears in the portrait with her, looking up at Lucy submissively and offering her a textile. And I'm saying non-white because the race or ethnicity of the youth is ambiguous and likely deliberately so. In 1716, the birds and many other colonists enslaved indigenous people as well as black people. The portrait exemplifies an idealized racial order in which all non-white people are subordinate. Here's a British print called Beauty's Tribute that exemplifies this constructed hierarchy and attempts to naturalize it. An ambiguously raced non-white youth serves a white girl. The poem under the image clarifies the intent of the composition. It reads, beauty commands submission as it's due, nor is it the slave alone that owns this true. Much fairer use shall this just tribute pay none fate deplore, but thankfully obey. In other words, a racial order with white people at the top was natural or fated. Lucy's portrait draws on this trope, visualizing an order in which non-white people are naturally subservient. However, the idealized relationship between a white plantation mistress and non-white people that's pictured here in her portrait was not accurate. Like other women, Lucy participated in the violent regime of plantation slavery. And according to William's diary, Lucy beat the enslaved laborers who worked at the Westover household and ordered them punish. For instance, he once wrote, my wife caused Prue to be whipped violently. And another time recorded, I had a terrible quarrel with my wife concerning Jenny that I took away from her when she was beating her with the tongs. If we think about the image of the beautiful female plantation mistress that the portrait represents in comparison with Lucy's actual behavior, the portrait story becomes more complicated. The enslaved people who labored at Westover, including Prue and Jenny, were in fact audiences for this portrait. And while we cannot know what the enslaved people thought about the painting, its presence in the Westover home was a constant reminder of its hypocritical nature. It bore silent witness to the violence of domestic slavery. It was also a reminder that white women were frequently around non-white men on plantations. And this reality, which was uncomfortable for white colonists, probably helps explain why there are so few portraits featuring enslaved people. Lucy actually pulls away from the red fabric that the attendant holds. She avoids touching the young man, actually calling attention to the anxieties over racial mixing in Virginia and visually separating herself from him. And this actually departs from English portrait practices where white women are showered in exotic gifts by enslaved attendants who offer gifts as tribute as in these examples. Lucy seems to actively reject the cloth, an object associated with the global textile trade, 
Instead, she points in the direction of the basket and the plain white cloth, suggesting both her access to luxury goods through the red cloth and her modest and virtuous preference for less ostentatious items, which asserts a moral authority as well as a rejection of non-white male attention. Lucy's portrait also includes a coiled grass basket. And I've not been able to determine the exact cultural origins of this basket. However, William Byrd regularly traded with local indigenous communities like the Pamunkey, as well as the Cherokee, Catawba, and the Creek who lived much further away. Here's a contemporary Cherokee basket made with similar materials, though this one's woven and not coiled. Indigenous women made and traded baskets and British colonists used them. And they also traveled in these transatlantic female networks. Here's a letter which records Lucy's cousin, Lucy Ludwell, gifting an Indian basket to a female friend in England. In her portrait, Lucy uses one as her sewing basket, suggesting just how common and utilitarian the objects were in Virginia. A sheer piece of finely hemmed cloth hangs out of the basket. The inclusion of this basket, which was so meticulously painted that we can tell its construction, indicates that it was important to Lucy. It is likely that the basket was brought to England by the birds, and it was certainly selected by them for the painting because Indian baskets in English portraits are incredibly rare. Her husband, William, was currently in London testifying about Anglo-Indian trade and politics when she was painted. The inclusion of the basket, therefore, references the Bird family's expertise in local Virginia politics and access to trade goods. In fact, the Bird family wealth originally derived from the Indian trade, which involved the trading goods like animal skins and baskets, but also in enslaved indigenous peoples. This is one of the very few colonial Virginia portraits that explicitly references indigenous peoples or culture through the basket and it admits the central importance of the Anglo-Indian trade to the family and to the development of early Virginia society. Lastly, the inclusion of an Indian basket filled with white English cloth is highly significant. Baskets filled with flowers and fruits were used to signify fertility in Western art. Here, Lucy uses an indigenous American basket thus appropriating an indigenous item to represent her reproductive power, which is further celebrated through her dress, which appears ready to fall open due to the undone ribbon and the placement of her arm, which serves to highlight her womb. However, instead of the basket being filled with flowers, it's filled with white cloth. White linens were symbols of English civility in the early 18th century. The basket and cloth, therefore, seem to celebrate Lucy's ability to reproduce whiteness and civilize the American wilderness. In fact, reproduction was recognized as a realm of female authority, and William Byrd II would write of his second wife, Mariah, she has her reasons for procreating so fast. She lives in an infant country which wants nothing but people. Then, she is apprehensive I should marry again if she should start first out of this world, but is determined to prevent that by leaving me too great an encumbrance. In other words, colonial women were necessary to populate the colonies and their ability to reproduce gave them some authority. The emphasis on female sexuality in portraits of women, including Lucy, can also be read as women owning that authority. The whole portrait then is a colonial and imperial painting that attempts to visualize and naturalize a social order in which white colonists were superior to non-white peoples and in which white women had an essential role in reproducing colonists for the empire. Now, almost 60 years later, George Washington was painted for the first time by Charles Wilson Peale at his home, Mount Vernon Plantation. This portrait also references Anglo-Indian relations and suggests that the American wilderness needed civilizing. This 1772 portrait was apparently painted at the request of Washington's wife, Martha Dandridge Custis Washington. This was the first portrait of Washington, painted before he became a national figure, 
It was intended to be a family portrait and to hang alongside that of his wife. Washington wears his militia uniform. He had served in the militia during the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 1763. However, the coat was slightly updated to the 1770s style, and he wears red pants instead of the blue of his militia days. He also wears a silver gorget around his neck engraved with the royal coat of arms and a military sash. A paper that reads order of march sticks out of his pocket. Attached to his back is a musket, more in line with the type used by hunters in the back country than the rifles used by the militia. And he stands in a rocky landscape featuring a small waterfall, and there are what I strongly believe are teepees in the distance. The whole landscape evokes the Ohio River Valley, the hotly contested territory where Washington served during the Seven Years' War. This was indigenous territory. Yet Washington was a rampant land speculator in the region. He was a member of multiple land companies that claimed land in the Ohio River Valley and along the Mississippi. He was also awarded land in exchange for his service during the Seven Years' War. So his interest in Western land was connected with his military service as seen in his portrait. Closely related to Washington's desire for indigenous territory, was his interest in developing canals and roads to better connect the eastern seaboard to the Ohio River Valley and through that valley to the Mississippi. In particular, he spearheaded efforts to develop a passage through the falls of the Potomac River, which was up the river from Mount Vernon. He believed that the Potomac could become the channel of conveyance of the extensive and valuable trade of a rising empire. In fact, just days before Peel showed up at Mount Vernon in May of 1772, Washington had been corresponding about the falls of the Potomac Project. Marylanders were blocking Washington's plans for canal and he was upset about it. So it seems likely that he and Peel discussed the issue while Peel was there. For years, Washington continued to promote the Potomac as a gateway to the West. In 1797, he acquired George Back's landscape of the falls of the Potomac seen here. So it seems likely to me that the waterfall in the Peel portrait was intended to at least evoke the Potomac Falls, which weighed heavily on Washington's mind while he sat for this portrait. And beyond the falls, we see a hillier landscape reminiscent of the Appalachians and the Ohio Valley. Moreover, the presence of the, the tents, likely teepees, suggests that Washington was thinking of indigenous territory. Teepees are portable structures used by indigenous nations in the plains. Washington's desire for Western land extended to the Mississippi Valley and the plains nations were increasingly involved in Eastern disputes and several communities had actually participated in the Seven Years War. Washington believed that indigenous peoples would relocate West and that colonists were destined to take over their land. In fact, that belief, along with the desire for indigenous land, is one of the primary reasons that Washington began to resist the British Empire in the 1770s. Following the Seven Years' War, King George III had issued the Proclamation of 1763, which forbade all settlement by English colonists west of the Appalachian Mountains. It reserved the Trans-Appalachian West for indigenous peoples, including most of the Ohio River Valley. The proclamation interfered with Washington's plans for that region. In fact, he wrote in 1767 that the King's restrictions on land settlement must only be a temporary expedient to quiet the minds of the Indians and must fall, of course, in a few years, especially when those Indians are consenting to our occupying the lands. So what we see in this first portrait of Washington is a man intent on gaining indigenous land, a man so obsessed with Western expansion that he chose to include a Western landscape in his only portrait and to memorialize himself as part of the militia that fought in the Ohio River Valley to gain those lands. Which provides us with an opening to complicate the history of this portrait in a way that moves beyond standard narratives of Washington. During his time as a colonel in the Virginia militia during the Seven Years' War, Washington assumed the name Conotocarius after it was given to him by Tanagrasan, 
a Seneca leader, also known as the Half King. According to Washington, he was named by the Half King, as he was called, and the tribes of nations with whom he treated, Conatocarius in English, the town taker, which name being registered in their manner and communicated to other nations of Indians, has been remembered by them ever since in all their transactions with him during the late war. The Seneca were members of the Six Nations, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy or the Haudenosaunee. Washington referred to himself as Conatocarius in a letter to Andrew Montour, an interpreter, in October of 1755, asking that Montour express his wish that the Oneida, who are allies and part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, settle along the Potomac River. He wrote, tell them how happy it would make Conatocarius to have an opportunity of taking them by the hand at Fort Cumberland. So what if we viewed this portrait of Washington as a portrait of Conotocarius, the town taker? Later, during the American Revolution, Washington waged total warfare against the Haudenosaunee, mostly because he wanted their lands, which were connected to the Ohio River Valley. In 1779, Washington ordered General Sullivan to destroy Haudenosaunee towns, writing, the immediate objects are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. The groups that they attacked had been trying to remain neutral during the American Revolution. Following the American Revolution, the Seneca declared to Washington when your army entered the country of the Six Nations, we called you the town destroyer. And to this day, when that name is heard, our women look behind them and turn pale and our children cling close to the necks of their mother. This first portrait of Washington, painted before he had to worry about his national reputation or his national memory, is an image that promotes indigenous dispossession and foretells of his later actions against the indigenous nations who prevented expansion by white settlers. So these two portraits are particularly rich in iconography, but together they show how portraiture throughout the 18th century was influenced by the interactions of white colonists with enslaved people and indigenous peoples. Colonial portraits are often described mostly as family documents or commodities that show off a subject's wealth, which they are, but they are also material evidence of cross-cultural encounters and the development of social and racial relations. Their histories also remind us of the interpretive potential when we consider the diverse audiences who interacted with these portraits, from white family members to enslaved laborers, to the indigenous peoples who knew these subjects. They also remind us that we should consider contemporary descendant communities as audiences who may have a very different perspective of these figures. Thank you. Thanks, Janine, that was great. Um, I know that I have a ton of questions for you, but I'm going to turn it over to Dan and I am excited to see that gallery space again to hear what he has to say about your presentation. Dan. Hey, good, uh, good evening, y'all. Um, I'm not sure why my camera is not working at the moment, but I'm sure it'll come up. Janine, congratulations. What incredible work. Um, you're doing. Um, I'm always a huge fan of, of all your stuff. There it is. <laughs> Technology. At least we can all talk to each other. Um, you know, it, I'm really impressed by Janine is how you take these portraits, these two in particular, which are, I think, probably very familiar to everybody in the audience. And you, you peel away some layers and show us things, at least I've never seen before. For example, the um, the teepees in the background of the Charles uh, Wilson Peel portrait. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process, sort of how you go about looking at um, these works and um, sort of unpacking them in different ways. Sure. So with every portrait that I've really ever 
written about and researched in depth, the first thing I always do is sit down and sort of try to write a, a visual description of what I see. Um, and try not to miss any detail because an artist spent a lot of time on these paintings and the subject paid a lot of money for them. So everything uh, was chosen very deliberately to be in that painting. Um, and then from there, I start asking questions about, well, why is this there? Why is it painted like this? Um, why is she standing like this? And then I also do a lot of comparative work. Um, is it similar to other portraits from the time period? Is it dissimilar? What's unique about it? Um, what's very common about it? Um, and then from there, I start doing a lot of, uh, trying to do a lot of archival research to see what was going on in the subject's life at the time. Um, as well as trying to better understand sort of the social context of, of the painting itself um, and digging into what was going on at that moment when these were being created, uh, both as, you know, in society at large, but also with these individual subjects' lives. Well, and, and there are all these audiences. I mean, these paintings are a conversation. They're a conversation between the artist and the sitter, between the artist, the sitter, and their culture, and then between the artist and the sitter and everybody who's going to come across the work. Um, and I think that's one of the most remarkable things is how you, I mean, we today, looking at these paintings, we are in the position of, of being a consumer of them, but we're also in that position very similar to ways that people in the past were. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, these paintings as things in their time. I mean, put, put um, these paintings into kind of their, their architectural context. I mean, who's walking by them every day? Who's seeing them? Who is the audience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one I think about a lot as I try to interpret some of these portraits. Um, I mean, these were intended to hang in their homes. Um, however, as most people who have studied, you know, colonial Virginia will attest, um, these homes were only really semi-private. I mean, a lot of um, events happened in, in homes, right? A lot of dinner guests would come by, um, people would come by and stay the night and visit for a long period of time. Um, at Westover, for example, um, we know from William's diary that sometimes indigenous people stopped at Westover and stayed for dinner on their way to Williamsburg or wherever they were going. Um, and so there were, you know, indigenous people visiting um, Westover. There were enslaved people uh, who worked in the home. And so the largest number of enslaved people who would have viewed these portraits were domestic laborers. Um, but there's also reason to believe that if this was in the passage, the most sort of um, public space in the house, that maybe some of the field laborers may have occasionally been looking at this portrait as well when they came for whatever business they needed um, in the house. Um, the friends of the bird family would have seen it and uh, and of course the family and very similar similar um, visitors at Mount Vernon. Now at the time Washington was painted he didn't know he would become such a prominent figure right he didn't know that people would make pilgrimages to Mount Vernon but he was having a lot of people at his house just you know regular socialization so same types of audiences were intended to see the portrait at Mount Vernon I think one of the remarkable things about family portraiture is it was always intended to be passed down through generations. Um, so we are, in a way, an intended audience as well, which I think is something to think about. Yeah, so like your, your ancestor is literally looking over their shoulder at you. They are a presence even after they're gone. Um, one of the pieces that you wrote following your dissertation for the Omohundro, I think really struck me. You talk about the process of doing your research uh, and, and going out and, and finding these paintings in what I like to call their natural habitats. I mean, uh, Lucy Park Bird and um, um, George Washington, obviously these are in public collections today, but I mean, a huge number of these paintings that you document and talk about, they're, they're still hanging on the walls or at least in the homes of descendants, aren't they? Yes, and it's pretty incredible. One of the few places um, that's open to the public uh, where you can still see like multi-generational colonial collections uh, is Shirley Plantation in Virginia. They have a painting dating back to the 1680s and they're um, still, the collection is still intact. Um, and I have had the privilege of being a guest in a few other private homes. Um, 
And it's pretty remarkable to see like uh, contemporary family portraits and photographs uh, below or next to these colonial ones um, and how these portraits still interact today with contemporary descendants is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, and just the idea of, I mean, we see, I'm sure a lot of our audience, you know, we see um, paintings that have lost their context. They show up at auction. We like to joke they're instant ancestors, but here are paintings that are actually, you know, part of this living family tradition, but at the same time, they illuminate all these incredible stories. And, um, you know, what's, what strikes me is we talk about in our field so much wanting to better represent the communities that we study and that we work with today. And then we complain, well, there's, there's nothing that depicts them, there are no objects. And yet, you know, through your work, we're really seeing that um, those stories are right in front of our faces. We just need to be willing to see them and look at them yeah. and, and interpret them. Yeah, and it's a challenge for museums and historic sites. You know, sometimes it can be challenging to say, you know, it's hard to interpret, say, slavery or Black history when we only have so many objects that we can associate firmly with, you know, a specific person. Um, but really, even these objects that look, you know, very white facing um, and tell a story about mostly white subjects, um, they were still made and interact, made to interact with um, a variety of people. And, and remembering that, you know, enslaved people, for instance, were audience members means that they were interpreting these objects very differently than the white family, even in their own time. And we can think about these multiple perspectives today, even with objects that don't necessarily scream, you know, black history or, you know, indigenous history. It, in your work with these paintings, um, were you able to find, um, and I know how rare this would be, but some, any sort of documentary evidence that, that maybe gives us even a small glimpse of how um, these other audiences actually were interacting with the, with the paintings? Um, I mean, we're all aware of apocryphal stories of people doing damage to paintings on purpose, but uh, are, are there cases that you can point to where um, where some of these audiences actually sort of have agency over these objects. Yeah, and one of the best and most easily accessible is actually comes from Equiano, a lot of Equiano's um, narrative of his life as a slave. Um, he actually, so you can find it, it's, it's usually you can find it open access, right? And it's a great uh, slave narrative that's been discussed quite a bit. But there's a great passage in there from when he was actually enslaved in Virginia, which is great for my research, um, in the 1750s. And he talks about being brought into the great house to fan his, the master. And he discusses walking through like the passage, passing an enslaved cook on the way who had her mouth um, welded shut with a bit and then entering the room where the, the plantation, the planter was sitting. And he talks about being watched by a portrait hanging on the wall. Um, and then he combines that with the fact that a clock was chiming. And so he, he writes about how, you know, he thought that the clock and the portrait, they might, you know, be watching him and they might report back to the planter about what he was doing. And so these planter portraits, I think, actually participate in sort of a, a surveillance system. Um, you know, obviously they couldn't talk, but there's sort of a sense that, you know, it's sort of eerie, right? That you're being watched by these figures on the wall. Um, there's also a great anecdote from Wilton Plantation, also in Virginia. It's a little bit later, it comes from the antebellum period, but um, Catherine Mariah Sedgwick traveled through Virginia and she visited Wilton House or Wilton Plantation, which was home of the Randolph family. And she talks about how one of the things they did to punish enslaved children was to lock them up in a room where the ancestral portraits were hanging um, because they were scared of the portraits. So again, there's like this sort of sense of surveillance that these portraits have with them. Yeah, and, and that's something that I think we have to work so hard to sort of get our own sort of minds around as moderns is that um, these portraits, I mean, even within what we would consider sort of white European circles, they, they are still, um, in many ways, sort of simulacra of, of the people themselves. Um, they, they're, they're the presence of the person that's not actually there. Um, I see we have a few good questions. So I thought I would um, see if we could address a few of those from the audience. Um, 
one of them from, um, is, have you found out any details about the meaning of the costume of the enslaved servant in bir the bird portrait or the um, textile that he holds? Um, so the short answer is uh, nothing definitive. <laughs> I've actually, I see a couple people who are tuning in are actually a couple people I've reached out to about this fabric actually. Um, I don't know exactly where it comes from, which is one of the reasons I didn't talk about it more. Um, it could be Asian, it could be um, North African, it could be you know English or perhaps made for trade with um, indigenous Americans. Um, my guess is it probably is associated with the indigenous American trade just because of the basket and um, William Burt's profession. Um, but uh, the symbol is sort of, you know, it could belong to several different cultural groups and um, the shape is slightly odd. So again, it's probably some kind of handkerchief, but it's it's oddly shaped. Um, so I'm still working on it. I've, I've reached out to a lot of people. If someone knows exactly, if they've seen that exact pattern somewhere, please let me know. I would love to know. Um, but I think it is, generally speaking, also just supposed to allude to the fact that Virginia was a place um, where global trade was happening and that, you know, the birds were wealthy and they had access to luxury goods from all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I think um, based on what I know of Decorative Arts Trust members, I suspect somebody at home right now is sitting there going, oh, I have a piece of that fabric over on my wall over there. And, and they'll get in touch with you. Um, an anonymous attendee asked uh, again about the young man in the portrait and their racial identity, which is of course very ambiguous and, and you make the case purposefully ambiguous, but um, also makes the point that this portrait really places the birds, not just within this sort of indigenous Anglo interface, but within this much larger um, vast early America, vast global empire. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how in general our scholarship has moved to embrace a much larger view of what the 18th century sort of British world was part of? Sure. So the specific part of that question first um, is I, I say deliberately so. So I actually found partially actually and thanks to a decorative arts trust emerging scholars research grant, which helped me pay for a trip to England. Um, there is an English portrait by John Klosterman dated to 1797 that features a a painting of uh, one of the Duke of Devonshire's, but uh, with an attendant that uh, is almost identical to the attendant in the Lucy Park Bird portrait. Now, Lucy Park Bird is not by John Klosterman. I don't think the style is not right, but the fact that this almost identical figure appears to me says that this is not a quote unquote real person, but is uh, copied or taken from maybe a print or another painting or some other source in visual culture, right? This is not actually an enslaved person owned by the Bird family. Um, so that's also leads to the amb ambiguousness of why they use sort of a stock figure instead of a real figure in the portrait. Um, he could be Indian, like from Asia, um, it's possible. Um, He's wearing a, a, suit, a suit of livery that's uh, reminiscent of sort of the Ottoman Empire, sort of this vaguely orientalizing uh, costume, which was uh, common and fashionable for enslaved domestics to wear in England. Um, but I think that does speak, um, as you said, to this larger global British empire. Um, and this portrait, I think, is really great evidence that colonists were um, part of global conversations and global trade that this was a portrait done in 1716 hanging in Virginia um, and that it you know it could easily reference Asia and India um, and it does speak to the fact that um, colonial Virginia was global and um, we shouldn't forget that um, it's more cosmopolitan than a lot of people think and the stereotypes of colonists um, this is actually a really fashionable cosmopolitan portrait. Well, and we forget that for somebody like the birds, you know, living on the James River, you know, their wharf is their connection to an entire world. It, it's not provincial at all. Um, do we know, what, what do we know about their trip to, um, to England? Um, did they bring enslaved people with them? Um, you know, William Byrd is, of course, known as being a great diarist, so you would hope there'd be a lot of information, but 
What do we know about their time abroad? Yeah, it's hard to tell if they actually brought any of their enslaved attendants with them on that trip because, of course, uh, the diary doesn't cover those specific years of when they were actually traveling. Um, but William Byrd had gone over um, before 1716, I think in 1714, maybe 1715, but he had gone over before Lucy joined him, uh, specifically um, because he, basically he and his political allies were fighting with Governor Spotswood, who I see behind you. Yeah, he's, he's right back there. <laughs> um, so they, he went for political reasons to testify against Governor Spotswood, um, but he was also testifying about the Indian trade, which Spotswood was trying to control and take away from um, traders like Byrd, and um, as well as the Tuscarora War and the Yamasee War, which were going on um, just south of Virginia and the Carolinas. Uh, so he was there for political reasons, and uh, Lucy appears to have joined him uh, sometime in winter or spring of 1716, because there's a letter documenting her arrival. Um, she may have just gotten sick of being home alone. Maybe she finally wanted a trip to London. It's, uh, you know, we don't know why she went. Um, and then they visited some relatives in England, and then by October she had died of smallpox. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what Lucy's daily life was like while she was in London. Um, we do have a diary from William Byrd from the year after she died, uh, 1717, um, and that lasts for a few years. And it, you know, it records Byrd socializing, visiting his friends, visiting, you know, people in the countryside, uh, attending masquerades. I mean, just living the high life in London. There, there was a question early on in the presentation asking about the portrait of Byrd's second wife. I think she's the second wife. Uh, whether or not you believed it was done by the same hand as the as the portrait of his first wife. You know, I don't know for sure. It's possible. Um, Lucy's daughter Evelyn was also painted around the same time that Mariah Taylor was painted. Um, it's possible, but it's hard to know for sure. I'd have to really um, study them both up close and together to make you know more of an assessment of that. Um, but the truth is there's a lot of artists working in that style and it can be very difficult to actually figure out which specific artist was painting any specific portrait. Yeah, something I really appreciate about your work is, is that you know, you're, you're all about finding the documentary evidence around these paintings and not simply trying to ascribe a hand to them. I think that's, um, that's a fairly new approach. I mean, for a long time, art historians working with portraiture, you know, it's all about putting a brand name on it. This is by this person. And yet, I mean, really, these paintings are incredibly important, whether or not we know exactly whose studio they come out of. They come out of a culture. They come out of a, of a, of a period. Um, exactly. They, Identifying the artist has been sort of secondary to my work. If I can find them, great. And sometimes it can add to the interpretation if you know specifically who the artist is. But I don't think not knowing an artist should in any way prohibit any kind of interpretation. Uh, similarly, I think a lot of these, because um, a lot of early Virginians were actually painted in England. I think similarly, there's been a lot of um, overlooking of images like Lucy's because they weren't painted by an American artist. Um, and then on the other side of the coin is that, you know, British art historians don't necessarily look at them because they ended up back here in the United States and they depict a colonist and said, so therefore aren't really part of the British canon either. Yeah, I'm, I think for the audience, it would be worth saying, I mean, how many portraits have you documented in early Virginia? I mean, I, I think the audience would be shocked at how many paintings you actually have either physical evidence of or documentary evidence of. Yeah, I have found records of over 500. Um, I have over five, about 502 or three, I think, individual records of portraits, either the actual portrait themselves, uh, records or records of portraits. Sometimes I just find references to portraits like in wills, for instance, or probate inventories. Um, and then, but a lot of those records um, are really unclear, right? So they'll just say like family pictures or seven family pictures, but we don't know exactly who's being depicted. And so some of those records actually record more than one um, portrait. So well, there's more than 500 um, that I've documented. I think it's interesting that they do show up in the inventories because, you know, presumably they, they have value, but, but their value is, is to a very specific audience. I mean, that's the problem we have today with, you know, anonymous portraiture. If you don't know who it is, it, 
not quite as attractive. So I think it, it's saying something that one, there are so many of these paintings and two, that so many of them are showing up in documentary records, which suggests kind of a cultural value to them. Right. And I wish more did show up in probate inventories. Like you said, there's actually, most of them actually don't. So it's always fun when you actually come across um, them in inventories and there's actually valuation to ascribe to them because uh, they typically weren't actually worth very much after they were paid for. Yeah, they were worth a lot to the artist uh, until they were paid for and then they were, they were done. Um, I mean, this is such, so we've talked a lot about the early Virginia portraiture. Why don't we move a little bit later to the portrait of George Washington, which is, you know, knowing what we now know of George Washington is, is such an incredible document of him just sort of right on the cusp of becoming the George Washington we know now. Um, following his service in the French and Indian War, you know, he's so interested in Western lands, um, but he's also, you know, married into this family. Um, and so I thought your point about how his painting really becomes the pendant portrait to Martha was really, um, was really fascinating. He's sort of casting himself in this new light as a newly married man. Yeah, it's great. Um, because, yeah, I love this portrait of Washington because it is before he became a national figure. And so when I was studying this, I had to keep reminding myself, like, he's not president yet. He's not commander in chief yet. Um, he wasn't even necessarily thinking about independence yet. Um, and this was commissioned and is believed paid for and commissioned by his wife um, to hang at home, right? This is a family document, um, not intended to be like a national image, right? Which is what it turned into as sort of like a symbol of his early, um, early military sort of prowess, right? That's what it became later. Um, but it's such a great portrait when you think about um, that Martha was painted originally in and probably in 1757, along with her first husband, Daniel Park uh, Custis, who is, by the way, Lucy Park Bird's nephew. Um, so she was painted in 1757 along with her husband and then her two children. And the kind of fun thing about the 1772 portrait of Washington is that he's painted in his militia uniform from when he was a militia officer in like the 1755-1758. Um, so in a way it also is painting him as he was sort of um, when Martha was originally painted by John Wollaston. Yeah, he sort of casts himself back, but I think it also shows sort of his remarkable understanding of how to how to self fashion himself. I, I can only imagine, you know, Martha has this really beautiful painting, um, very fashionable for when it's done. She says, George, go get a painting. He comes back with that and, you know, just her her reaction, you know, you're painted in your militia uniform from 20 years ago. Um, and yet it says so much about him and his ambition um, because of all the material um, in the painting, both what he's wearing and then and then the background um, as well. Um, and then of course he rises to, to prominence. Um, I'm just looking to see if we have any other questions from the audience here. Um, oh, this is a great one from Lisa Barker. She says, portraits by Wollaston seem to have the same eyes regardless of the subject. That seems to indicate lack of skill or excess of laziness, or is she wrong, Janine? one of my favorite lectures you've given was actually, I think, titled Colonial Portraits, They Don't All Look Alike. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of our sort of more common misconceptions about 18th century portraits and, you know, of course, the, the classic Wollaston almond <laughs> eye that they all have. Yeah, uh, and I, you know, I have like a soft spot for John Wallison and John Hesalius as contemporary because they often have similar critiques made about, you know, their lack, their supposed lack of skill. Um, I think the gently almond shaped eyes is actually very much in fashion, even in England, although because um, some artists like Thomas Hudson, who Walson has been closely linked to in terms of following his style, um, his eyes do seem to be vaguely almond shaped too. Um, but you're right, there is sort of like a skill level where um, perhaps Walson, Walson's not quite as skilled as Thomas Hudson um, in the English painters whose style he was following. Um, but I think um, the truth is, and in my larger sort of research, I've, I talk about this more and I've done more work on this, but I think that these sitters actually wanted to be portrayed like this. I think um, there was something about looking like everybody else 
um, that mattered to them. They all have, they have very similar clothing, a lot of similar compositions get repeated. And I think this is actually a social um, a decision um, to say, you know, we're all part of the same social group um, and that it was an aesthetic choice. It was, they like, you know, they wanted to be painted that way. So I think what to us looks just like lack of skill is also um, a deliberate choice on the part of the subject and the artist. Um, and there's a handful of portraits by Wollaston, um, especially some earlier ones, and then some of his later ones, for example, from Charleston that show greater sort of variation and skill level that does also suggest that he was making deliberate choices along the way to make most sitters look very similar. Yeah, I think it's always interested me is when you look at some of these um, sort of the blue chip early American artists, but who, who paint in different places, you really do get a sense of what's fashionable in different locations, the format of the portrait, the size of the portrait, how they handle the individual sitters. Um, you get a real appreciation for the flexibility that these artists had to meet the demands of their clients who ultimately, you know, they're the ones paying for, um, for this painting. Um, Michael Hartman has a really interesting question and observation about um, sort of Washington and Western expansion and the use of landscape. And he, and he references an article I wrote about the artist George Beck um, in the Mesda Journal. Um, Beck, of course, painted the, uh, two pictures for the, I think it's the dining room um, at Mount Vernon. Um, and they're installed there, beautifully reinstalled there. Um, but he makes a great point. He brings up your great point, really, about how Washington chooses to use landscape uh, in his painting. And I think that's, um, that's really well brought up because these aren't, even the landscape, you know, even the sort of what you would think is just the stuff dashed off in a hurry in the background is critically important, right? I mean, it's part of the whole package. Yeah, well, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more to um, that question or that comment about, I know you've been working on sort of the back that country, right? What happens in the 1790s and stuff after this Washington portrait, if you want to speak a little bit more about, you know, this Western expansion and landscape. I mean, just that, you know, Washington realizes that the next great phase of, of Anglo-American expansion is going to be across the mountains. And he realizes that critical to all of that is the transportation infrastructure. And, um, he also realizes that it's most advantageous if you can get that, uh, those agricultural goods to flow back through places like Alexandria and Baltimore and not you know, downriver to New Orleans, which is ultimately where they're going to go. And you know, obviously he has great economic interest in say Alexandria uh, being the, the great port for, the, for uh, inland America. Um, but he also recognizes that there's, um, there's some political challenges if New Orleans becomes the port for the entire uh, Midwest. Um, because there's a moment in time where, you know, folks in Kentucky are saying, you know, we kind of like the Spanish, we kind of like the French, we really like to be able to trade with New Orleans. So he knows that how important it is to be first with that transportation advantage. Uh, but he also knows that all of his land out there is, of course, worthless without a market. Um, and so, you know, he, he has this land, he's looking at ways of unlocking it. He knows that um, finding a way around the falls of the Potomac is going to be key to that. Um, he knows that finding a way across uh, the Appalachians, uh, if that's possible, will be key to that. Uh, and it's amazing when you read late 18th century, early 19th century American history, the, the schemes people come up with to try to bring trade across the Appalachians um, as opposed to down through New Orleans. Uh, it really, it's not until the railroad um, mm -hmm. that that becomes practical, but um, it's an interesting chapter in American history. And you can see glimpses of this uh, in Washington's sort of self-fashioning in the 1770s. Yeah, and I think one of the avenues sort of in decorative art scholarship and, um, and that you know, you're working on other people can work on um, is how you know, art and material culture can speak to these issues of Western expansion and how these aesthetics also flow West um, during this period of expansion. Um, 
and linking to the idea of the picturesque that um, he brought up, how aesthetics can also be in a way a political argument because by painting it as picturesque and desirable, they're helping to you know pave the way for you know expansion or you know make people get on board with expansion um, by painting it as a desirable landscape too. I see Carrie has popped up, and I but I did want to ask one last question. Amy Torbert has a question here. Um, one was just recognizing your incredible research, but also asking if you have ambitions to sort of do other studies for other states like this one. I mean, South Carolina is ripe for work, um, not to mention New England. Um, what's next? Yeah, so what's next is, well, hopefully I finish the book on Virginia portraits first, <laughs> which is already a big task, um, but I would act, you know, the one region um, I keep coming back to is actually New York. Um, South Carolina, Maryland all deserve more. I mean, all of the South deserves more attention. But when I was doing all this research on these planters from Virginia, I kept also thinking of these large farmers or planters really with these New York plantations in rural New York and how New York also has a very early colonial portrait uh, tradition that develops there. And I just kept thinking about, you know, what would we learn if we compared early colonial New York to early colonial Virginia, or what if we developed that area of, of research more? So that's actually, um, that that area, that region has really um, captured my interest as well. No, I think that's really interesting. And I think that, that there's a fascinating parallel there. Maybe after the second book, um, an exhibition that really starts teasing these ideas out on the walls of a gallery would be incredible. Sounds like a project that I can't wait to see come to fruition. Um, we are almost out of time, but I would be remiss if I didn't give each of you an opportunity to catch us up on projects that you have going on and where you're currently at in the case of Janine in particular. Um, uh, so Janine, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing um, your new role and how people might be able to access your scholarship um, in different ways uh, virtually. Um, and then Dan, this one. Sure. Yeah, so um, you can find sort of right now um, my database, uh, all the 500 and you know, plus portraits I've recorded are on, available online at colonialvirginiaportraits.org. Um, so you can check that website out that has a lot of my research freely available. Um, I've got an article coming out next month in Panorama. So look for that. It's on a 1680s portrait. Um, and then I'm, I'm currently got, you know, trying to get some writing done and hopefully we'll have more publications on Virginia portraiture in the future. Um, through the end of the year, you can find me at the American Philosophical Society. Uh, starting in January, I will be uh, Associate Curator of American Art at the Chazen Museum of Art at the University of Wisconsin. So you will also be able to find me there starting in January. Great. Congratulations, Janine, on your new position. I can't wait to um, be able to travel again and come visit you in Wisconsin. Um, I'm still here at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts here in Winston-Salem, and we are doing our best to serve the needs of our community locally and nationally um, through efforts here on the ground to support our teachers here in North Carolina and beyond with our online field trip programs, um, but also making sure we're supporting all of our scholarship um, both internally and externally. It's amazing how many people have projects that they've been wanting to do. And all it took was a global pandemic and a quarantine for people to find the time to do the work. So, you know, we are working really hard to um, meet our scholarly mission in every way possible um, through our research center, through our collections, um, but then also working with teachers and students um, as they try to navigate um, this strange time. And you can find out more about all those efforts uh, at our website, mesda.org, um, at our website, oldsalem.org. You can learn about our Study South project, which is sort of the umbrella that all of this is falling under. And you can follow us on social media um, where you'll probably see some material coming out about a new program and podcast we're launching called um, um, Things, a global conversation, which actually takes objects from our collection and pairs them with other objects from all around the world. So it's an interesting opportunity to create conversations just like this one that, you know, really can only happen because we're all forced to use these online technologies. We can have these sort of multi-state, multi-country conversations. So that's what we're up to down here at MESDA and Old Salem.
Uh, thank you both so much. This has been a fantastic talk. I feel like I have gained an entirely new understanding and appreciation for colonial portraiture, which I'm sure um, all of our participants have as well. I want to thank uh, the Marie and John Zimmerman Fund for sponsoring this lecture. Um, and all everyone out there, please uh, check out our website to see all of our upcoming virtual programs um, and consider donating to the trust. And I hope to see you online and hopefully in person sometime soon. So thank you both again and have a great night. Thank Good you. Night.